I am thrilled to introduce Dr. John Farrar as today's speaker. Opioid prescribing and opioid efficacy have long been topics of massive societal importance with implications for patient suffering and patient pain relief. Policy decisions are driven by data, and Dr. Farrar's work contributes important data that expands our understanding of the long-term efficacy and safety of opioids prescribed for chronic pain. So without further ado, Dr. John Farrar is Professor of Epidemiology, Neurology, and Anesthesia at the Perelman School of Medicine, the University of Pennsylvania, and he is the current president of the U.S. Association for the Study of Pain. He's been involved in clinical research for over 30 years with a major focus on clinical studies of the efficacy of pain therapeutics and the design of pain clinical trials. As a neurologist and a pharmacoepidemiologist, he's been involved in randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, and methodological studies of pain and associated symptoms. He is current PI of an FDA-funded contract to study the use of opioids in treating pain and a second contract to evaluate treatments for acute pain and is principal investigator of the Penn Specialized Clinical Center as part of the NIH HEAL EPIC Network Initiative. He's a co-investigator for the NIDDK-funded Data Coordinating Center for the Multidisciplinary Approach to Pelvic Pain Research Network. Additionally, he co-directs the Master of Science and Clinical Epidemiology program, a two-year program focused on training up to 30 fellows per year to launch their independently funded clinical research careers. Um, his research continues to focus on improving clinical uh, trials design and also examining data on current therapies to improve the quality and validity of evidence in pain therapeutics. He's speaking to us today on the evidence for efficacy of chronic uh, opioid use, 12-month opioid data studies. He's going to be speaking for about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for a rich Q&A discussion. So please, as he's uh, delivering his lecture, feel free to chat in any questions that you have into uh, the chat function, and we'll be handling those at the end of his lecture. Uh, Dr. Farrar, welcome. And please go ahead, share the screen, and we will dive into your talk. Great. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, you know, to talk to all of you. I'm uh, very interested in, in hearing what kinds of questions you have, um, but I, I hope that you'll be uh, gaining something uh, from this talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the use of FDA data to try and understand some aspects of pain uh, therapy uh, using opioids. And uh, as Dr. Darnell said, I also have a contract with the FDA to look at acute pain treatments. Um, and that's a different topic that we're beginning to publish on as well. Um, so first of all, in terms of disclosures, I have funding from NIH and FDA. Uh, and I'm an occasional consultant on study design issues with Vertex Pharma and, and uh, another pharmaceutical company, and I'm currently the president. Um, what we hope to achieve is uh, the uh, to give you some sense about the evidence for and against uh, stable opioid use over time, uh, some understanding of the potential risks and uh, uh, benefits potentially of opioids over time, and an understanding of the pros and cons of uh, enriched enrollment randomized withdrawal trials. That may seem like uh, a lot, but it, I think it will fit. Um, one thing, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about the opioid epidemic. Um, I think most of you have been reading extensively on this topic. Um, so I'm not going to cover that specifically, but we all know that there are serious contraindications to the use of opioids, uh, but a lot of back and forth about whether there's any evidence of it working. Um, obviously, uh, the epidemic raised questions about whether there's any long-term benefit to the opioid use, but I would argue that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, and rather it indicates an important gap in our knowledge. Uh, and that we need to try and address that. Now, one of the interesting things about 
all of this is that it obviously uh, fits nicely with the idea of how do we adequately treat pain, because obviously pain remains a significant problem in the United States. Uh, the ideal approach uh, to managing it may not include opioids, um, and clearly uh, reducing the amount of opioid that's used uh, and limiting it to where it's really needed uh, will help to avoid um, uh, um, the misuse of opioids, but also uh, avoid pain and suffering. Um, and it requires the development of guidelines, and you know there's been a lot of efforts there. Um, and the use of opioids only as appropriate um, is, I think, and continues to be uh, a useful component of what we do in taking care of our patients. And I'd like to contribute uh, some evidence to that uh, today and, and to uh, see what you think about it. So <clears throat> the, what we need to understand is that there are almost no uh, randomized trials of chronic opioid use in the standard format of parallel studies where you keep people uh, on uh, placebo for some extended period of time. It is probably unethical to do so. Uh, <clears throat> and the original studies of the chronic opioids that were created, uh, OxyContin, uh, MSContin, et cetera, uh, are much older studies and all of that data is basically uh, either uh, in boxes or in old format uh, that are not accessible. But what are accessible and what we uh, decided to try and study was the abuse deterrent formulations. All of these products required FDA approval <clears throat> and the structure of the NDA application uh, was as follows. Uh, they had to have some formulation that demonstrated achieving blood levels. Then they were asked to conduct a randomized format. And what they, the uh, format that's been used predominantly is an enriched enrollment randomized withdrawal trial, which I'm going to explain to you, although a number of you, I'm sure, understand what they are. Um, like to try and add a little color to what these mean. Ultimately, uh, patients were then offered a 12-month drug safety study, uh, and a fair number, probably around half, or, uh, went on to these studies um, with uh, addition of outside patients who were titrated to an efficacious dose on the opioid. Um, and these studies dispensed drugs monthly. The dose was adjusted monthly if needed. Rescue, unfortunately, is not very well recorded, but it was left up to the care provider, uh, and we do have a little bit of information about that. Uh, the pain measures were measured at least monthly, although in some of the studies they were measured daily. Uh, and then there are self-reported uh, adverse events. And so it occurred to me, to us, that we could really learn something by looking at these 12-month studies in terms of how opioids were used. Because in general, opioid use is not studied for this period of time. So we gained access uh, through a uh, FDA BAA, Broad Agency Agreement contract. Um, these are available and they're something that you should look at if you are not familiar with them because they do provide access uh, to FDA data. The focus was to evaluate on the new abuse deterrent formulations and to try and uh, use this unique opportunity to explore chronic opioid issues. Uh, we had to evaluate the stability of the effect, and in order to do that, we needed to harmonize eight 12-month uh, 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 safety studies. Um, all patients were titrated to effect in the opioid dose. The dose of opioid was then used uh, and measured over the full period, along with any reasons for discontinuation. So to be as complete as possible, um, there were 14 studies that we identified that met our criteria. There actually are around 600 total studies in this space, uh, but the majority of them are pharmacokinetic studies measuring uh, access to the blood system, um, and uh, almost none of them uh, were in this format. Um, so we looked at 14 uh, and uh, there were no duplicates. Um, now we, you know, we had access to uh, the, the full data set online, and so it was pretty straightforward. Um, and then <clears throat> the number that were screened for eligibility, uh, of those, we found that we could use eight, with six of them um, not having um, uh, the, the patient data available. And it, it's a long conversation about what happens to data at the FDA, but needless to say, not all the data remains at the FDA, which I didn't know before we started. Um, the number of studies that we looked at, <clears throat> we then had a number of participants 
3,644. Um, and I'll show you in a minute uh, what happened to those participants. Um, and then we looked at the in, uh, individual patient data uh, as a summary for what we were doing and uh, the, the study that we wanted to conduct. The um, opioid studies that were available to us were three hydrocodone and five oxycodone. Uh, it's important to note that two of them, the two targeniques listed in, uh, circled in yellow here, uh, were done for uh, looking and comparing oxycodone to um, reg with naloxone to oxycodone alone for constipation. Now, this provided a different uh, format for the way the studies were conducted, so we decided to look at it with both with these studies included and without. Um, and there's a variety of different drug formulations here uh, and a variety of rescue medications. Um, so <clears throat> just to keep that in mind. There were a set of standard, relatively standard inclusion criteria that, that basically uh, match with what we do when patients come to see us, uh, moderate or severe non-cancer pain, uh, inadequate response to previous analgesics. They needed to qualify for around the clock opioid use. And I'll show you this in a minute. There were some opioid naive patients um, that were in theory opiate naive. We'll talk about that. Um, and so just they had to be uh, considered uh, 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 eligible for uh, long-term use. Uh, obviously there were exclusions, including um, uh, adjuvant treatments that were not stable, poor health, widespread pain syndromes. Um, and, and that included some neuropathic pain, but neuropathic pain was included. And any history of illicit drug use uh, with a positive drug screen. Now, this is important, obviously, because we're not looking, and I'll show you the data on how many patients ended up having that diagnosis added during the 12 months, but they were excluded if they had this up front. Now, these, the thing about these exclusion criteria are they, again, are consistent with some of our clinical care. And so I think that lends more credibility to the study that we did. All right, so the enriched enrollment design, if you're not familiar with it, patients are titrated, they're screened for eligibility and then titrated onto a particular drug. Only those who respond are then randomized to either being down titrated to a control, generally a placebo, and or maintained on their active drug. And what we're looking at is whether they maintained a response over a period of time um, and uh, or whether they lose that response over time. Um, these are generally 12 week, some of them are a little shorter. Um, and then patients from these studies are offered access to the long-term safety studies. We are actually looking now uh, at these studies and I, I'm going to um, show you, no, and um, I'm happy to talk at some point in the future about what we find with those uh, analyses, but they're very different. What we're focused on today is the long-term safety studies. So just a, a buprenorphine example, uh, patients are screened. Uh, they generally have an analgesic taper um, and then are put on uh, an open label opioid drug, in this case, buprenorphine. They need to attain adequate pain relief, less than four out of 10, and they need to be uh, remain within the guidelines of the opioid use uh, limits that are set for the study. They're then maintained for um, a period of time and at the randomization, uh, they're uh, titrated over a period of time to the placebo um, and then they're followed up after that. Um, to talk about how these studies fit into the general uh, issue of, of pain randomized trials, parallel studies since 2007 overall have shown a mean difference um, of about uh, 0.66, which is relatively small. And it, there's been discussion about what happened with trials because before 2007, it was nearly double that, in fact, exactly double that in terms of the size, the ef efficacy that was seen. Crossover trials have a, a bigger effect. Um, as you know, in uh, using crossover trials uses the individual as their own control and has additional power. And the ERW tri trials, which were started and not conducted before 2007, there were none, uh, have a higher difference than the standard parallel studies and so have a higher degree of efficacy. Why do we need enrichment in clinical studies? Well, let's, uh, let's be clear about it. If, 
we need to focus on the people most likely to have the problem of interest. You're not gonna surprise anybody, right? You're not gonna test pain treatments in people who don't have pain. And all of the studies need to have some sort of enrichment, otherwise known as phenotyping. We talk extensively about the need for phenotyping in our clinical trials. And frankly, uh, enrichment is what we do every day in, in diagnosing uh, patients in clinical care, right? Someone who gets uh, comes in for chest pain, you're gonna wanna know whether that pain came because uh, they got hit in the chest with a ball as opposed to having the onset spontaneously with difficulty breathing. So we always do enrichment. The question is how much and how we do it. In pain studies, um, we have difficulty in understanding the underlying etiology <clears throat> in what causes pain. For example, in chronic low back pain, etiology could come from a variety of different sources as is listed here. Muscle spasm obviously is a predominant uh, source of pain uh, uh, which occurs in response to some of these others. And factors that facilitate nociceptive input transmission to the brain and perception of that pain can vary. Issues related to anxiety, depression, uh, um, and, and a variety of other measures that we use in doing such studies. And thus, any clinical trial of chronic low back pain is going to involve a heterogeneous group. One of the real issues is how do we detect real effects in this heterogeneous group? And the ERW studies are um, sometimes used to try and do this because they identify a population with the phenotype that potentially can respond to the treatment if a treatment truly exists. ERW studies have advantages. They're like parallel trials. Uh, they potentially less issues with recruitment since every patient is going to be treated with the drug, at least during the titration phase. The population uh, selection um, is specific for patients with the phenotype and an increased likelihood of responding to that drug. And the titration period leads to less missing data because patients with serious side effects are gonna drop out before the randomization. The run-in period excludes patients uh, with potential side effects, and it handles variability in participation response to treatment uh, by titrating to an effective dose. So you demonstrate that the patient has response to the drug before you randomize them. Now, obviously that response could be because of the drug or could be because of a, of a placebo effect or, or change in the natural history. So there are some issues here. Uh, it's not completely clean, but at least you know you're, you're isolating the group that has the potential for response and is unlikely to have side effects. Um, the disadvantages obviously is that when you withdraw patients, especially on opioids during the opioid, during the taper, uh, you know, could be that um, the withdrawal is, uh, creates a set of withdrawal symptoms, uh, but we've actually been looking at this recently, and it turns out that blinded withdrawal has, is less problematic um, than open withdrawal. And in fact, in many of these studies, there's no difference in this, in the uh, measure of uh, side effects in the treated, the group that continues on treatment, the group that goes to placebo, a discussion for a different day. Uh, the randomization of the time uh, can can be uh, the issues can be reduced if if you um, don't standardize it. They don't know when they're going to be uh, withdrawn, and to allow a reasonable use of rescue throughout the study. Uh, the randomization of timing of the transition, I think, is a key issue. And that, however, was not done in these studies. All of these studies were uh, they were ran told when they were randomized, and so they knew they might be withdrawn. And then obviously the generalizability issue because you've picked the, you've enriched the population uh, can be an issue in thinking about how to apply these results to a more uh, general population. So here's a consort diagram. And really the issue is we started with um, over 4,000 patients uh, of which uh, a large number were excluded uh, relative to these uh, events here. Uh, in the titration phase, uh, there were about 4,000 and uh, 762 did not achieve uh, titration. Uh, in other words, we're not able to attain uh, adequate pain relief within the, the, um, the limits of the dosing or had side effects. And so what we ended up with in our, um, in our uh, maintenance period <clears throat> was um, about uh, this number, about 3,200 patients. Um, and a, a percentage of them dropped out over the, over the 12 months maintenance period. 
um, and those are listed here uh, with the reasons for dropping out. You'll note that it includes 16 total deaths, of which two were accidental oversight, uh, overdose and two were suicide. Um, and if you do the math for that, it's higher than the standard uh, rate of suicide in the general population. So there is clearly an increased risk of suicide in this population, although only two events makes it very quite variable. And so we're, we're not really drawing anything from that. We needed to harmonize the data. Let me tell you that this takes a long time. Most of the data is in the CDISC STDM format, a specific format designed for data uh, recording across a broad range of studies, but is usable for pain. Uh, the, each individual company then creates an analytic data set um, and um, those files were available to us, but we decided to use the primary data um, and so that we were not uh, potentially biased by reasons for uh, dropping out patients. Um, we reviewed the protocols to understand what the issues were, population, inclusion, exclusion, and uh, other th issues. Um, we then obviously had to uh, do things with the, with the data that was recorded, even though uh, the data for sex was recorded in the same place in every file, at least in theory, uh, they were uh, recorded with different uh, coding. Some were MF, some were male, female, and some were zero, one, and we had to harmonize that. Um, identify the timing of the data collection. Each study had a different set of timing issues, and I'll talk a little bit about how we dealt with that. And then we had to establish rules for handling differences in data in terms of the number of times and scales used and the coding differences. So a bunch of work to get these done. We solved a number of problems that I just, and I'm going to discuss or present four of them just so you understand. <clears throat> differences in timing of the pain measures. What we did was to use all of the pain measures in all the patients and calculate an overall trajectory over the 12 months um, as a linear approximation. You can do other approximations, but um, a line worked pretty well. Um, how to assess opioid over time? We basically looked at the beginning and end dose that they were prescribed. Our uh, impression, our decision was made and not including rescue. Uh, our decision was made because if patients took additional rescue during the period, their dose of extended release opioid was increased. So at the end of the study, they would have been on a higher dose of medication if they needed in a substantial increase in rescue medications. Uh, we looked at the variation in the period of titration. Um, different studies titrated for different periods from between two to, to six weeks. Um, uh, and what we decided that on the with a maximum titration of six weeks that we would apply 45 days of titration to all studies. So we basically made the beginning point 45 days after they began their titration, even if that included some of the observational period. And then we accounted for tapering off opioids in the same uh, patients at the end of their participation in the study. There were a variably recorded for you know, some of them had data for two weeks as they were tapered off, some did not. And so we, we moved the end point uh, to uh, 14 uh, to 21 days before the end of the study to avoid uh, looking at uh, uh, differences in their opioid dose that were related to the titration at the end of the study. Patient demographics, um, <clears throat> as I said, we had about 3,200 patients. Um, the mean age was around 50 with uh, a slightly larger female group. Um, it was almost all white, and you might notice the constipation studies were entirely white uh, with a very few Hispanics. Um, the constipation studies did not uh, measure uh, height, um, and so we couldn't get the uh, BMI, but we were able to get their weights uh, to use instead. And then <clears throat> in terms of opiate naive patients, there were a total of 894 in the study uh, versus about uh, 2,300 that were uh, opioid tolerant. And we'll talk a little bit about their specific opioids that were used uh, are here. You'll notice that none of the patients who started in the oxycodone constipation studies were on hydrocodone. The majority of them were on other drugs. So there were differences and we uh, looked to see if any of these made a difference in our results and I'll show you those results. We looked um, in terms of pain history, uh, there were reasons for them being in the study, but we thought it was better to look at what they 
recorded as uh, having as a pain problem. And so these are not unique identifiers. Uh, the majority uh, or a larger uh, number of patients had uh, back pain, um, about uh, 2,400 out of the 32, uh, and the other values here. The osteoarthritis also is quite large. The two of these tended to overlap. We then looked at comorbidity by history and a variety of different uh, values here, which I'm not going to go through in detail, but we did look at all of these things uh, as we went through. We then <clears throat> tried to figure out how best to present this data. And I'll have to say that uh, my analyst, uh, Phil Coschetti, came up with this, and I think it's a very cool diagram. Uh, basically, this is showing the linear uh, values for their pain over time. And um, it's, it's divided by a bunch of different changes over time, with the uh, green and blue being improvement or, uh, and the two values in here, uh, these three being stable, with the red and orange being people getting worse. And so you get a sense that there's a balance, if you like, between the, you know, about 50%. And, and that turned out to be approximately correct, not exact, but uh, we can talk more about that. We looked at it and divided it by hydrocodone and oxycodone. They don't look substantially different here. Uh, we also looked um, at um, not just the pain score, but what about the, the brief pain inventory score? And there was a um, interference score there that we used. We used the average uh, of the seven uh, values in that interference score. And we looked at those changes over time and got a very similar sort of graph to what we saw with the pain. Then you'll notice that the number is less because not everybody had a, filled out a brief pain inventory. We also looked at the SF36 for the two studies that we had uh, that had this, and we just chose physical function score. Uh, and again, what you'll notice is that there is a distribution uh, that's about 50-50 in terms of people who had improvement in physical function versus those that didn't. Um, we then looked at the pain doses over time, and, and what you can see is the red is an increase with the yellow being stable and the blue being a reduction. Very few reductions over the 12 months with the majority of people remaining stable, and you'll notice that people drop out uh, to this degree um, in the study over time. Um, <clears throat> we then looked at outcome uh, measures of benefit, and so uh, in the dose of medications, you can get a sense of Better or stable is the number up here. Uh, and so uh, there were um, slightly more than 50%, um, or it's two thirds that had a stable or better dose of medication over time. Around two thirds had a stable pain over time. Um, about a half <clears throat> of this number here with the brief pain inventory had a stable brief pain inventory and about two thirds um, had a better or stable um, pain, I'm sorry, uh, SF36 in the smaller groups. How did we decide what was stable and what was uh, worse? We had decided that pain can change over time, but that we wanted to hold them to a pretty tight set of confidence intervals. So we allowed up to one point change over the 10, over the 12 months. Um, and, you know, if it was, uh, if they got better, uh, it went down, they were, they uh, were better if they were stable. Uh, it was uh, between these, and so th this is the two that we lumped together to say the patients tolerated the opioids well over time, and if their pain increased by more than one, then they were said to fail. And we, there were some studies that had a VAS, and we simply divided the uh, zero to 100 by 10. For op opioids, we looked at milliequivalents of morphine, um, and obviously they either got better or they were stable or they increased over time. The brief pain inventory, again, we took an average of the seven and applied this, the same one point difference. Uh, with physical function, it uh, depends on the scale you use. They used the version two of the SF36, uh, which had three categories. So you could get a one, a two, or a three. And there were 10 questions. So it was a 10 to 30. And we, uh, again, chose a rather conservative value of uh, two uh, to either getting worse or getting better, noticing that a decrease in the SF36 is getting worse, um, stable is getting better, and an increase um, is when, sorry, a, a decrease, they're getting worse is when there's an increase in pain in, in the SF36. And if, if they uh, 
have a better PF10, uh, they get a decrease in, um, in I'm, I'm misspeaking, it's written there correctly. The SF36 goes the other way from the pain score is my point. Uh, increases in values in the SF10, uh, in the physical function 10 is an improvement. How did we then combine these? Um, we basically drew a graph uh, with the dose increases, pain decrease, stable, and dose increasing the same here. And we chose these four where the patients were either stable uh, on the dose, stable on the pain, and did not get worse. And so we value the, we look at these as being two dichotomous groups in terms of whether they got better or not. Uh, stayed stable or got better or not. And so <clears throat> we called this the top left of those four. When we had then went to look at what happened with the outcomes, uh, what you'll notice here is that the, um, is that the values, uh, and, and we can focus over here, uh, show that about 44% <clears throat> of the patients when looking at pain and dose remaining stable or getting better over the 12 months, 44% approximately uh, maintained that for the 12 months, whereas 55 did not. When we looked at the PF10 versus the and uh, stable dose of opioids, again, in only two studies, so a lower number, um, it was 52% that remained stable. And with the brief pain inventory, again, with a reduction in numbers here, it was about 51%. So some change, but not hugely different. You will notice that the number is higher in the oxycodone cons, um, constipation group, especially with the pain dose. And our, our understanding of that is that these patients entered the trials because they had constipation. Um, and so they had been on opioids for a longer period of time and were more stable. Um, and so it's not surprising that they should remain uh, with a higher uh, stability over the 12 months than the others that we looked at. We also looked at three of them together, and we could only do that obviously in the ones in the in the studies that had all of them. And we found a lower a value, but still uh, about a third of the patients uh, had a stable pain, uh, opioid use, and physical function, and slightly more than a third, uh, almost a two fifths, uh, ended up having stable pain uh, uh, or improved pain uh, with dose and a stable or improved brief pain inventory. Um, so these results were reasonably consistent over time. <clears throat> um, okay, another way of looking at this, and I'm not gonna spend time here, is just to draw a Venn diagram. When we submitted this for publication, they asked us for a Venn diagram. The bottom line though, is that these are all subgroups the BPI is a subgroup, uh, the SF36 is a subgroup, uh, and the overlapping pain syndromes are a subgroup. So I'll leave this for you to look at at some point. We then tried stratifying these results, um, looking at them. <clears throat> and what you want to look at is the uh, patients that met criteria. We separated out those that did not meet and the missing values. Uh, and we combined these in some of the, the tables that I've been showing you. But you'll notice that there is not a big difference between male and female. Um, there is um, not a huge difference in the studies of opiate naive versus the previous opioids in the pain studies. But as I said before, in the con constipation studies, um, there is a uh, substantial difference uh, related, we think, uh, as I said, to the uh, probably long-term use of, the, of these before. Uh, they were entered into the study. With the age categories, again, not huge differences, although there were relatively uh, uh, fewer older folks. Um, and so there is a, a, a difference there uh, of about 10% 10 per, 10 over time, but still in the same general um, ballpark. We can look also at how many milliequivalents of opioid they were on and, or got titrated on. That did not make a difference. And we looked at the titration period, and there was a slight difference um, over time, but really not. And so we are comfortable with choosing the 45 days because it makes all of the studies relatively equivalent. We did look at other aspects of this, and we looked at non-compliance in the various groups. Um, 
and 83, um, so 2.8% had non-compliance, uh, 1.8 had a protocol violation, um, and then investigator uh, option to remove patients was there. Suspected diversion was very, very small at 14 patients, uh, and there were a bunch of other uh, reasons for patients uh, uh, getting out of the study. <clears throat> And in terms of possible use and misuse um, with um, the oxycodone pain, there were 65 patients that were given that diagnosis during the 12 months, only 15 in the constipation study, smaller number uh, as a percent. Uh, and then looking at the oxycodone as a total, the hydrocodone here had a slightly higher rate. Hard to know what to make of that um, because the data is uh, so selected, but uh, it's there for your consideration. So overall, uh, about 45% of the selected patients had a good 12-month outcome, um, and it's a very select population. We cannot know uh, what would have happened to these patients if they, if they had not been started on opioid therapy at all. And so that is a major limitation to this study. Uh, but these are demonstration that patients who are stabilized with a demonstrated benefit in the titration period on opioids uh, do uh, about half of them or 45% go on to maintain that benefit for 12 months. Um, and I think that this is especially important in thinking about large groups of patients who are unable to take non opioids uh, for whom other therapies um, and treatments for their pain are not sufficient. When you get to refining this group, it's not a huge group of patients, but there is a clear group in my mind of patients who may need to have chronic opioid therapy and if you do that in, with careful selection, uh, they will tend to remain stable over 12 months. Um, we're, you know, obviously these um, are, are um, related, I think, to how you can treat, best treat patients. And I'll, I'll leave this for you to, um, to look at. Um, <clears throat> limitations, obviously we're looking at people volunteering. So predominantly a group of patients with chronic pain primarily not neuropathic pain. I didn't emphasize that when I was on the slide. They met inclusion criteria, but this is consistent with recommendations for the careful selection of patients in non-cancer pain who might be eligible for opioids. In the last couple of minutes here, what I'd like to do is to talk to you about the second piece of this, which is the development of a prediction model of patients who might benefit from opioids. Uh, this paper is uh, under review currently, um, but um, <clears throat> I'm going to go through just the high, the high level of findings from this to try and, and help you understand this. Um, what we did, uh, obviously, is that we, we looked at all of the baseline characteristics that we could come up with, um, and there's a long list here, um, and so I'm not going to go through that. We created prediction models to identify patients likely to respond appropriately to opioids over time, and um, various outcomes were used to explore this. So not just pain and dose, but pain and dose, BPI and dose, 36, SS36 and dose, and then the combinations of those to see if we could predict any of them. Um, here are the studies again, just to remind you, two of them were constipation studies. And so we looked at it with and without the constipation studies, but it did not make much difference. Here's a list of some of the variables, not gonna go through all of this, I'll just point out that the brief pain inventory we explored using the individual uh, seven questions, but we ended up looking just at the overall interference score because that worked the best in our study. And we found that actually combining some of these variables into single outcome and single exposures actually improved our ability to do the prediction. Um, the frequency of potential predictors, I'm not going to spend time going through this, but it will be in the slide set that you have access to, and please feel free to look at this. Um, but you'll notice that almost 40% still had anxiety, 45% reported depression, even though if they had severe anxiety or depression, they were excluded. Um, other things, hypertension was interestingly high, um, and, and obesity was not. So we have to be a little careful about how we think about obesity. We know that chronic pain can be higher in obese patients. Insomnia was another huge um, component, and it turned out that combining insomnia, uh, depression, and anxiety, that they had a lot of overlap, um, and it, it worked better if we combined them. A variety of different co concomitant medications that they took, 
you know, antidepressants at 30%, <clears throat> excuse me, antiepileptics or the adjuvant therapies um, at about 20% and NSAIDs at about half. So we did this in a number of ways. One is to start with a univariate value, and I'm not going to show you all of them, although uh, this will be in the paper. Uh, this is the ones that ha had a higher AUC, uh, which is an area under the curve using an ROC. And I'm just actually going to skip to that. You might be familiar with ROC curves. They look like this. And they're basically the, the, uh, how well the, the prediction model works. An ideal one would go to 100% right at the beginning and stay at 100%. And uh, this one is less, it's about 6.64. Um, and so what we did then was to do this for each individual item. And we listed the ROC curve here. The highest that any single item did was 0.59, which is actually not bad given it was the BPI interference scale. And it turns out that this is probably a pretty good thing to measure along with the history of anxiety um, or the history of anxiety or depression together uh, along with insomnia. As you get down, <laughs> the values go a little bit lower, but higher pain at screening also uh, and the uh, pain syndromes, it turned out that uh, looking at the individual pain syndromes created a higher degree of variability. We ended up counting the number of pain syndromes patients reported and found that a value of greater than or equal to, se to four out of seven um, had a reasonably good uh, value, um, almost as high as the individual, uh, as the full numbers. And it's just much easier to apply a, uh, a cutoff scale to clinical care. Um, so we did the uh, stepwise regression um, <clears throat> as uh, using a p-value as a, a standard approach to this. And here's the uh, set of uh, values we got with everything, including the two constipation studies. Here's the one without the constipation studies. Identical areas under the curve, slightly less variability when we included more studies, but we didn't feel that excluding them was necessarily either of benefit or, or made things worse. Um, we then <coughs> tried to develop <clears throat> prediction models and what we did here was rather than use the p-value, we looked at whether it would increase the area under the curve. And as you might be aware, area under the curve is an important feature in terms of thinking about what might be clinically useful. You need an area under the curve of about 0.7 to 0.75 um, to give you adequate specificity and sensitivity. We never got there is the end. Um, but <clears throat> we did get to a 0 0.6. Um, Three, looking at the uh, at all of the studies together, not excluding the ones with the BPI, and then we got to a value of 0.66, looking at those that included the BPI in the data set, so a smaller number of patients. Um, I'm going to go back here and just point out that there were certain factors that had an impact. Uh, clearly, the history of anxiety depression made it, um, um, interestingly, um, <clears throat> more likely that you would be um, successful over the period of time with your opioids. That's interesting. Uh, the, his, no history of benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines turned out to, to be an indication that you were not going to do overly well. Um, these were all statistically significant, but I just, I want to warn you that the overall value of this is still relatively small. So although these make sense and fit with things that we know, we can't go out and say, yes, obviously benzodiazepines are terrible. This supports that, but it is not proof. Um, and then the total pain syndromes, um, if you were less than or equal to three, you were likely to be more successful over time. Um, now, the other thing to remember about anxiety and depression is that most of these patients um, were being treated for anxiety and depression and did not have severe anxiety and depression. Um, and the treatment probably is the reason why there's uh, some benefit or success over time. If we look at the brief pain inventory um, outcomes, then we get basically the same values for the pieces that we had before, along with the brief pain inventory. Um, and this comes instead of the pain screening uh, at, at the beginning. Uh, and this is a value between one and 10. So this is a value for one. So if you wanted to look at a change of three, it would be higher. But obviously, the brief pain inventory uh, 
interference scale uh, takes that into account. And so that other measure no longer fit into the value, but we never got to a high enough value to, to really be able to say that these were usable to predict who's likely to be successful. Um, and so the implications are that there are you know, many variables of interest that we looked at a whole host of them, as many as we could. We never reached the value of 0.7 or 0.75. So there's no clear prediction model um, that reached enough sensitivity, specificity, or area under the curve to be clinically useful. But the, some of the factors that fall into those models obviously fit with things that we know about the use of opioids and how to assess patients on opioids. And so in summary for the overall talk, our goal was to explore the potential efficacy over 12 months and to develop a prediction model. We did identify a group of highly selected patients with demonstrated initial benefit through the titration on opioids and who maintained that with adequate pain control and no increase in their opioids over 12 months. We were not able to, to uh, define an adequate model to be able to predict who those are before a priori, uh, but that some of the factors that we know, stable pain dose, dose of medication, brief pain inventory interference scale, and the physical function scale, I didn't show you that, uh, but have some factors that are potentially useful. And I will quit there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, well, thank Dr. You. Farrar, for an excellent lecture. Um, it, so fascinating, you know. I when I saw this uh, this study and your data, I thought it was just so crucial um, to bring forward your documentation that there is a defined subset of individuals when carefully se selected appear to benefit from prescription opioid use over the long term without uh, major adverse effects or uh, common perception that dose will always escalate or patients will deteriorate. So you've, um, you and your colleagues have, have carefully refuted those common misperceptions and also this absence of definable characteristics of who will respond really speaks to the individual variability and the need yeah. to address the needs of each person as the individual they are. So I just think your, your data are so crucial, so important. And I want to thank you for, for doing this great work and, and bringing it forward and sharing it with us. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. We also have questions. I want to invite people to please chat in your questions. The first one, uh, how do you deal with enrichment studies and selection bias? Yes, okay. And, and, and this is a, a, a subject that is brought up uh, all the time, which is that enrichment studies clearly are selecting a, a part of the population. So we know very clearly that they do not apply to the entire population. But as I said in, in my uh, presentation, what that means is that we need to be careful about how we apply it. But I would argue that every clinical trial we do has enrichment. We're not gonna use antihypertensives in people who don't have blood pressure problems. What we are doing here though, is we're selecting a group of the pain patients and we're not selecting the entire population. And so I completely agree with you, we have to be careful. The one thing I would say is that the process that was used to select patients for this inclusion are the similar kinds of things that we do when we talk to patients and try and decide if they're going to be uh, able to participate. The other piece of this is that we then try and titrate them on opioids and the ones who have real problems are not included in this analysis and are probably, uh, you know, are, are problematic and deserve further study by you or your colleagues to make sure that they're eligible or would be appropriate. So I completely agree with you that there is an issue, but it doesn't uh, obviate the fact that there are patients that might do well. It means we need to pay attention. We need to monitor, we need to treat them and measure things before we start to treat them. And honestly, this is a very select group. So I'm not pretending like we should go out and treat everybody with opioids. I you know, have been accused of saying that. That's not the point. The point is that there are some patients and many of you who have taken care of patients know them who just do well over their lives with opioids and it makes their lives livable um, and that we ought to keep that in mind. 
Terrific. Um, Larry Peskin, uh, as a result of actions taken in response to the opioid crisis, there have been substantial increases in the use of Belbuca and Suboxone in this population. Patients are often compelled to transition. Patient advocates report decreased efficacy for pain relief with buprenorphine-based products. Is there any data comparing your data to response to these products in this population? Yeah, um, we actually have access to buprenorphine data, um, which we are currently in the process of analyzing. Um, and it is, um, but there are almost, no, there are no studies that do a direct comparison. And to your point, I think that the revision of the CDC guidance to say that people who are stable on, on a reasonable dose of opioids and living their lives appropriately need not be titrated down and off opioids, um, along with, I hope, data that supports the fact that there are people who will live at least for 12 months without changes in pain and without increase in opioids should be an argument for continuing some of our patients uh, on pain. Now, um, we can look at and think about the fact that patients ought to be uh, an attempt to titrate them down to the lowest effective dose is clearly important. Um, and that that ought to be done on an occasional basis. And we're actually looking at some of that as well. Terrific. Um, Howard Fields uh, says, brilliant talk, wonderful discussion on the problem of getting clinical data and evaluating patients. Any data on titration? If patients got worse, that is added evidence that the drugs work. Yes, so Howard, uh, great question, and I will just tell you that we're currently looking at the withdrawal period during these studies. Uh, we don't have final data yet, um, but it looks like um, their withdrawal um, does not cause increased um, withdrawal side effects, but does have a reduction uh, in their benefit when their pain gets worse. So there is evidence in these randomized withdrawals, in all of them, that there is benefit. Um, and we hope to uh, complete that analysis and, and publish some of that later this year. Terrific. Uh, Carlin Edwards, how do you understand your findings in the context of prior work on opioids and hyperalgesia? All right, so I could spend the next three hours talking to you about <laughs> hyperalgesia. The bottom line about hyperalgesia is that <clears throat> there are many, many things that pr prompt uh, an increased response to pain, not the least of which is uh, banging your right elbow. Your left elbow will be more sensitive to pain. And in fact, your whole body will be if you test it with uh, appropriate uh, um, uh, heat or, or pinprick. Um, and it, there's no question that pain makes you more uh, sensitive to pain. Opioids also have this effect, but I think that we overdo the issue of what it means to have hyperalgesia. It doesn't mean that it makes your pain worse. What it means is that you're more sensitive to the nociceptive input uh, if you give it peripherally. We just don't know if it makes a difference in your chronic pain. It could, and I'm not arguing it doesn't. But I think what we're showing here is that in spite of that, there are patients who do be better on them. You have to be very selective about those patients. Sean Mackey, great talk and important contribution to our understanding of long-term opioid use. The data showed about five to 10% opioid misuse. Do you know how they defined misuse? It has been yes. variably defined from truly problematic to behaviors that we wouldn't typically think of as being an issue. Yes, and, and that is one of the problems, Sean, which is that we don't have good uh, recording in this data. It was a 12-month safety study. They were really just trying to get it done to get this, their products approved, and so they didn't capture this. This is the diagnosis given by their caretaker, by their healthcare provider, and, and we really don't have more data on that, but your point is well taken. Um, you know, All my patients needed to do to get that diagnosis was to for me to go on vacation for two weeks. <clears throat> Thank you. Lee Luna, in the context of chronic use of extended release opioids, what are the key research gaps that need to be addressed to better understand the patients who may experience stable pain reduction? And how can this information be utilized to improve pain management strategies? 
Great question. I'd love to, again, spend another hour discussing this, but the EERW studies are basically trials where you take patients and then you randomize them, have to come off and have to stay on. In theory, we could take a population of patients stable on opioids and get them to enroll in a randomized withdrawal period with the appropriate limitations to that and demonstrate that they actually continue to get benefit. It's really hard to know how to do this, but I think there are ways we can begin to think about it. Wendy Myers, are there any studies done or data collected on patients that are already stable over years with their pain levels and their prescribed opioid levels? The answer is no, and, but that's exactly what I'm talking about should be done. You can randomize them or do an N of one study in that individual patient, but in terms of groups of patients, we could look at them uh, with a randomized withdrawal trial format. Chad Collis, the OPAL study from Australia was published online in uh, Lancet a month ago, resulting in a brisk debate on social media. Do you have any comments on the study's findings? Um, there have been a, several studies that have looked at the um, detriment of use of opioids in chronic pain. And just to be very clear, um, patients shouldn't necessarily be started on pain. Uh, on opioids for their chronic back pain. Um, you know, there is good reason to believe that other things are going to be as effective, but I would argue that there are some patients who will benefit from a day or three of, of getting opioid, but we don't have studies to really look at that. These studies, just to be clear, are group means. They're group changes. Within those studies, there will be patients who got benefit and there will be patients who got harm, and we need to work to a try and uh, identify who those are so we can better treat our patients. Um, Andrea Anderson, do you object to the use of the consensus definition developed with multiple stakeholders in a collaboration with the NIH? Um, this is the consensus definition of a stringent criterion, the consort definition requiring an opioid use episode lasting at least 90 calendar days including either 10 or more opioid fills or 120 or more days supply? Um, there's no easy answer to that question. I, I'm currently, we're currently involved in looking at some opioid studies with the National Academy to try and understand these issues. And there's a variety of definitions. None of them are perfect. They all have limitations. I don't I'd have to look more carefully at, at the individual components of this, but it sounds like a pretty uh, stringent criteria. Um, we're, we're using a different one for the National Academy study that we're involved in, so. Great, uh, Samantha Adcock, with patients who have multiple chronic overlapping pain conditions appearing to be less responsive to opioid therapy yes. in your findings, although the studies all indicate that participants were titrated to affect did the study protocols include a maximum MME dosage or was titration to effect for each individual patient? There was a, a limitation uh, of approximately 120 um, milliequivalents of morphine uh, in all of the studies. Um, but to, to your point about widespread, about a more extended pain syndrome, there are a number of studies, <laughs> including one we're currently trying to publish, um, that look at the effect of widespreadedness on response to therapy. And it, at least in the studies that we've looked at, the wide, more widespread your pain, the less likely you are to respond to any therapy, but also to opioids. You know, there's a whole issue of what widespreadedness means and, you know, neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, multiple joints, et cetera. But I think that that is consistent with what we're seeing in other studies. Terrific. Um, last question. Um, there are many more questions, but we do need to give Dr. Ferrara a break. Last question from Christine Sotmeri. Do I understand that for a pilot program on multidisciplinary integrative care, we should first see who benefits and then randomize taking these modalities away from half the group? Okay. So, um, one of the key features about an enriched enrollment trial is that it is similar to a crossover trial in that if there are extended benefits of the treatment, 
then it uh, may not be the appropriate mechanism. And so one would argue that in the you know, non-pharmacologic approaches to therapy, physical therapy, uh, mind-body interactions, et cetera, um, that there would be an extended benefit. And so trying to take them, you know, this away would be number one, impossible to do because people hopefully would continue to do them anyway. And number two, the carryover effect would probably make it difficult. But for drug studies where the effect would be relatively short, like opioids or others, um, it should be possible to do this. So I don't recommend it for the kind of study you were suggesting. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Farrar. And I want to echo Rhonda Favero in the uh, chat who said, thank you for a fascinating discussion. I wish we had time to answer all of the great questions that have been chatted in. Um, just uh, want to yet again, thanks Dr. Farrar for a really terrific study, a fantastic presentation. Thanks to all of you for joining and for contributing to the discussion. Uh, just one final announcement that Dr. Vitali Napado is our guest speaker on September 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific time, and he is speaking on brain mechanisms supporting Patient-Clinician Therapeutic Alliance. Um, as always, this is a free public CME lecture, and you can register at the Sprill website. Thank you all. And if you'd like to review Dr. Farrar's lecture, it will be available on demand and on our YouTube channel. Thank you yeah. all. And thank you, Dr. Farrar.